and this is a funny quick story, his dog was trained to watch his indicator. And when I fished with him out west, I was from the east, and we didn't use indicators at that time. I still don't use them. But Gary had that on his line. I said, what's that? He said, that's my indicator. Watch this. And he cast it out, and he had a hit, and his dog was sitting in the water next to him, and his dog would bark. Chester would bark when he got a hit on the indicator. I couldn't believe it. The dog was so smart. That was Chuck Frimsky with a classic Gary LaFontaine story. The man who created the largest fly fishing show on our home planet today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you get a chance, it would be great for you to check out the giveaway we have going on right now. You can just head to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. And, uh, and we've got a bunch of giveaways going on. This one, um, you're going to have to check it out. <laughs> Click over there to find out what we have there. It'll be a surprise. But we're going to have some pretty cool stuff going on, including trips and coffee and stuff from our sponsors, all sorts of good stuff. Today's episode is presented by the Fly Fishing Film Tour. The Fly Fishing Film Tour is back again for 2022. F3T returns to theaters near you for another season on the water. Tons of rod bending action, tons of storytelling, and tons of swag. Uh, local conservation partners, all sorts of good stuff today, including some of the best film in the fly fishing space. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash F3T to find a show near you. That's wetflyswing.com slash F3T. Check it out now. Check out a show. Stonefly Nets is putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood nets. When Ethan designs your net, it's his hope and goal to help you create some lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. Chuck Faremski, the founder of the Fly Fishing Show, tells the full story today we discover how chuck finds his celebrities for the show the connection to ed sullivan and the beatles we got a little uh, kind of an interesting uh, kind of a connection kind of a story i guess and a uh, and another wiggler pattern uh but chuck breaks out some good stuff we, we get in a bunch of history this one's a lot of fun so uh, other than hoping to see you at a show, hopefully I saw you at a show already this year, um, I just want to say, without further ado, here is Chuck Faremski from The Fly Fishing Show. Let's do it. How's it going, Chuck? Hey, terrific. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the time and putting this together. We, uh, we had your son on, Ben, way back in episode uh, 61, and we're, we're approaching 300 episodes now, so it's been a little while. Ben gave us a nice update on the show. We're going to dig into that. You have one of the, you've built one of the largest fly fishing shows. I don't know if it's in the world. We could talk about that, but it's big. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I first, before we get into all that on the show, um, bring us back to how you first got into fly fishing. Well, I had a neighbor that had a drugstore across the street from where I lived. And his doctor suggested that he get into the outdoors a little bit because his heart wasn't as strong as it used to be. He said, you need some exercise. So he he would go fishing three days a week before he'd open his pharmacy. And I just knew him and I, I said, you know, I want to go fishing. I want to learn as much as I can. It's a great sport. So he would pick me up at 4.30 in the morning and we would go fish at a pay lake about a half hour away and we'd fish until about eight o'clock and he'd drive home and I'd catch the last bus to school and go to school right right for three hours of fishing three days a week. But that's how I really got into general fishing. And then I ran into a, an older fellow that was catching crappies on a fly rod. And I thought, eh, that's pretty cool. They're not that big and his fly rod's bending and they're fighting good. And I, I asked him to show me how to cast. And that was like the first time I roll cast to the fly rod. Nice. It's, that was way, way in the beginning, but this jumping ahead past high school and into college, I I had an elective at Penn State and I 
heard so much about the course that George Harvey started at Penn State. It was the first course in the country that was ever credited by a college, and it was called the Fly Fishing Techniques by George Harvey. Yeah, and uh, I was finding a, a note about him when I was looking in my desk the other day, and he he taught over 35,000 people how to tie flies that went to Penn State and fish. So I was one of them. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So basically you... So again, yeah, it comes back to that program, and um, and now I think George Daniel is uh, is running things there. It's it's exactly. been a pretty exactly. yeah. That program has been amazing over the years. It seems like it's influenced so many people, including you. I mean, so the show, so basically that gets you into it. So talk about how how and when this fly fishing show started. The idea, well, how did this? Uh, yeah, I got to be pretty good friends with George during the class, even though he was a brutal teacher. You don't know all the things that he did in the class, but if you had your your wings cocked wrong on your dry fly, he'd look at it and say, yeah, they're not exactly the way they should be, and he'd take his scissors out and cut them off. <laughs> and then you got to start over. So wow. he was tough. But anyway, after I graduated, I would go back every year for the opening of trout season to Penn State, and I would stop and see George. And, of course, he would always look at my tackle, and then I remember him embarrassing me because I had a spinning rod in the back of my truck with a couple fly rods. He said, what's this? I said, oh, it's a spinning rod in case it's, it's windy. He said, well, okay, but I never do any spin fishing anymore. So he influenced me, and I fished with him a couple times when he wanted to get away. And uh, he, he was the one that started me thinking about these shows because when he finished teaching at Penn State, he was sort of bored and I would see him every trout season and, you know, he'd go fishing for a few hours, but then he'd come back home and read the paper and whatever, watch TV. And I said, you know, why don't we get you starting with another class? And at that time I was at Seven Springs Mountain Resort where I had opened up a store. I had worked with leather as a craft and I opened up a leather store at seven Springs and I had belts and buckles and jackets and wristbands and everything. And the owner of the resort and I became very good friends and he had an opening in the exhibit hall. And, you know, he, he said that, you know, why don't you do a fly fishing show here? And I never thought about it. And uh, that's where I started the first event but the way I got to know something about the first examples of fly fishing at a show was the one that I went to, and maybe you know about it. It's the Midwest uh, Expo. The guys mm -hmm. did it in the FFF. It was FFF yeah. then. Now it's uh, it's Michigan FFC, Michigan Fly Fishing Club. And they actually had the first show that was strictly all fly fishing. There were a lot of sportsman shows around the country forever but fly fishing was two three five booths maybe at the most and another two or three hundred booths of archery guns fishing tackle boats whatever so that's what i did i went to that show i heard about it and it just blew me away and i came back from detroit which was like a pretty long drive to western pa and i talked to herman the owner of seven springs i said is that convention hall still available to use he said yeah all you have to do is bring me a lot of people that want to eat and drink and spend money in the restaurants and i'll let you use it for free when it's not not booked so that's kind of like the beginning of everything i owe it all to uh the guys in michigan at the midwest fly fishing expo i think they're I think they're into their 36th or 37th year now for it and i just I just said it uh, for 30 years now, last year. So, gotcha. So this is the fly fishing, yeah, fly fishing international, right? The this is the uh, what used to be the federation of, of fly fishing, right? But it's it's still run by their club, and it's a the difference between their show and the show I started is they had applied for a nonprofit uh, exemption from taxes and whatever, and they had. They had a pretty big size club and they had a treasury and I just had a dream and a little bit of money. <laughs> <laughs> so the difference was 
they don't have to make a profit, but I would have to pay for everything out of my pocket. So it was a little nerve wracking for me to start the first show. I didn't know whether I was going to go bankrupt or get divorced or whatever. Right, <laughs> right. So in what year was that? Just take us when the seven, that first seven uh, Springs Mountain Store uh, show. I have a brochure that I dug out of my desk and it was April uh, in 1990, and it was April 21st and 22nd, and in Pennsylvania at that time, the trout season opened at the 15th, usually, the Saturday by the 15th. So the weekend after trout season opened, I did the show, because oh, this wow. way people could come up to the mountains at Seven Springs, and they could go to the show one day and maybe go fishing, because we at that time, we had 39 approved trout streams within... 45 minutes of the resort to fish so you could fish and go to the show and i kind of paired that together so that was the first year oh my okay so 1990 and that brings it back to me because i mean i remember well 1990 and that's the thing i mean there were shows out there i mean you know on the west there's lots of shows that have been going on i think in through the eight i'm not sure when do you have any idea when the take it back to the actual, you, you mentioned Federation of Fly Fishers. You think those are some of the first actual fly fishing shows? Well, that that was the first all fly. See, the difference is oh, it's either fly. part of a sportsman show. The big show that really had the most fly fishing of all the shows was in San Mateo. And you would know the history maybe of Ed Rice. And he yep. unfortunately yep. passed away, I think, last year or the year before. But he started the uh, shows uh, in uh, San Mateo. I don't know when he had them, but he had one building that was all fly fishing. But he had a building that was all boats, that was all spin fishing. One was archery. He was at a fairgrounds. And then, but that building had the most fly fishing people of any show that I had ever heard of in the country. And he was famous for it. And the, <laughs> I, I'll get into this maybe a little bit later. I got to know him because he had heard about somebody that was doing a fly fishing show. And Ed was a great guy, but he had, uh, I don't want to say, when I say an ego, but it was a positive ego because he was so successful. And when he heard about the show that I had started, um, it's, it sort of said, who is this guy? <laughs> I want to know yeah. what this is about. But, but anyway, he had his show for a long time, but it was a sportsman show. And then in the East, up in Suffern, New York, which I think still goes on, and that was another guy that was famous with shows was Paul Fuller. And he had one in uh, New York. I think, he had, I think he had one in Pennsylvania, maybe in Philly at one time. But he had maybe 20 booths or 25 booths of fly fishing and then another 200 of general outdoor mm -hmm. fishing stuff. But I was the only one that started the show that was 100% fly fishing. And I, I paid for it myself. It was, it was for profit because I needed the money to pay for the facility and to hire the celebrities. Yeah. The celebrities. Exactly. So, so yeah, that, that takes us there. So basically you were the first fly fishing only because yeah, like I said, the, the stuff out, you know, Ed Rice and all that stuff was definitely a sportsman show. So it was kind of a little bit of, which are still going, they're still going on. Oh but, yeah. So fly fishing now is, is your show uh, now that was 1990, many years ago. Are there other fly fishing only shows out there uh, now? Well, there are, uh, there are a couple, I don't know all of them because, uh, they don't always tell me well, what happens is someone comes to my show. Well, it's my son's show now. And they see all these people and they have basic math and they say, okay, if it costs $10 to go to this show and they have 4,000 people, oh my God, I could do this and become a millionaire. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Good luck, fellas. Keep it yeah. up. I've seen so many shows compete over the years. I've done it for like 30 years. I can't remember all the ones that came in and went in a yeah. year or two. So all you need right. is one snowstorm and uh, nobody comes and you're bankrupt. Bingo. Oh, there you go. Just like that. I had a lot of problems. The worst show that uh, I had problems with was the one in Boston. And actually, it would be this coming weekend right now. But we postponed it till April because of the same things that always hurt us. 
Now it's the pandemic. But over yeah. the years of maybe eight years when I was running it and concerned, all I had to do was watch weather and find out if Tom Brady was doing good at football. Because <laughs> I wanted to find someone that would like some of the mafia guys maybe here in Jersey say, hey, guys, can you break Tom Brady's legs for the weekend? <laughs> he cost me tens of thousands of dollars because everybody on Sunday would watch the Patriots play. That's right. They, our show would empty out at, at noon. Oh, my god! <laughs> at 1 o'clock, they'd be in their motel rooms or back home watching football. That's hilarious. And we always had 12 or 15 inches of snow that weekend. Yeah. It was crazy. But people still came. Friday was packed. Saturday was packed. It depended on whether the Patriots were in the game on Sunday or not. Yeah, that's right. The Patriots. Yeah, and everybody. They, some people love Brady. Some people hate him. He's definitely, obviously, a great quarterback. Oh, he's an icon. How can I compete with this guy in yeah. Boston? They loved him. Exactly. There's no competing with Tom Brady, that's for sure. So, If I went into a bar, I'd have to buy my own drinks. If he went into a bar, he could drink all day for free. <laughs> that's right. So is it? Uh, so that's just Tom Brady in one little region. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're not going to get into the whole COVID thing, but I right. mean, that that's obviously, I mean, other than this COVID thing that we've gone through for you, has there been anything close that's kind of rocked you know, over the years since you've been doing it like this? Not really. I've been lucky. We had a real bad rainstorm that frozen the roof in New Jersey one year, and they had a rubber roof, and it was flat, and they got cracks in it. Mm. And in the middle of the night, uh, I got a call and said, there's, there's water dripping down on my booth. Oh. Matter of fact, it was Fly Fisher's Paradise that's still in business in State College. So we had to go and get big plastic sheets and stretch it out under the roof. And then there was another time when someone pulled the fire alarm off at the mm. hotel where we were all staying. And it was a Saturday night that you were sleeping because you had a long day at the show. And that kind of scared us. But no disasters. I, I often, you know, I often hear the weather people say, hey, we got it. right now we have a storm coming along the East Coast. And they say there's going to be millions of people without power. And that did happen to one show that Paul Fuller had, I think, the one up in Suffern. They lost power the weekend of the show. People were in the show, and all of a sudden the lights go out and it's black, and they have no power for the weekend, and then the show's done. <laughs> wow, there you go. But I've been lucky, I guess. I was really lucky. Because the last show I did before the pandemic started – it was the following weekend in March that they had a big show at the facility where I was, and they were setting up on Thursday, and the governor came on, and they closed everything down, and everybody was setting up their booths, and the guy that ran the show had to come around and say, okay, pack up. We got to close up the show. Everything's closed. And that was the first weekend of the pandemic that started in March two years ago, and we had our show the weekend before. We were lucky. Oh, but nobody yeah. got sick from our show. We didn't know anything about a pandemic. No, no, no. Uh, no yeah, that was that was well before. Wow. So you've had so yeah, obviously this pandemic has has rocked, you know, uh, your thing and everybody else. But um but you made a transition. Talk about that transition because I I've asked people before where they had the father and son stuff. And I have my own, my dad, you know, we I talk about that sometimes, the transition that we made and stuff. But um you know, how was that? Was it hard to give it away to Ben and let him take the reins? No, not really. The only the hard thing is that I don't know everything that's going on, and I knew everything that was going on when I ran the show. I don't know how many people signed up or canceled or how big it is or who the speakers are until Ben gets it all done himself. And then I find out. So I'm not involved on a daily basis uh, talking to celebrities right now. I know them all, but I don't talk to them as much because I'm I'm not hiring them to do the events at the show. So that's the only thing. It, I go to every show and I introduce all the celebrities at the major seminars. And then I hang out and do a lot of dirty work, get coffees and whatever. So I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not the big cheese anymore, but that's OK because Ben's doing a better job than I ever did. You know, when I started the show, I did everything on a yellow pad with a pencil. <laughs> And I, I tell people that I was so backward. I had a hard time. I transferred my work to a ballpoint pen, but I couldn't figure out how to get the point out. There's a little button on the top. 
that you push and then it comes out and then you can write. But he does everything now on a computer and he's on the phone all day long besides the computer. So I don't know if I could do the job that he did right now. But he's doing a good job and the transition unfortunately happened when this pandemic started. He ran a show, I think, two years and then the pandemic hit. And so I always felt a little guilty that why did I hand over these shows to him at such a tough time? But he's been he's been bounding back because, like I said, we had the final show a week before the pandemic started. So that summer, everybody had no show immediately. It was like the drape came right down over you. You didn't have time to prepare. Mm -hmm. So we hope yes. everything's going to go. We have so many people that wanted wanted to go to the shows that have their shots. I would like to see a statistic on how many serious fly fishermen have had the shots to prevent them from getting the virus. And I think that that's probably the highest percentage of any group of people because, you know, when you, when you can't catch a trout that's feeding on a trico because you have a size 18 trico and you switch to a 22, you got to be pretty technical and believe in the science. So I think everyone wants to keep keep breathing and and got the shots and hopefully it's they're all working real good and nobody gets sick. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the shots are, regardless of whatever you know. I think everybody's like for me too. You know, I'm like you know what I want to do some traveling. I don't want yeah. anything to slow me up this year. So I'll just give me what I need. I'll take it because I don't want to mess around this year. I want to get out and do some great fishing and some great trips. And I think a lot of people are thinking the same thing. You know what I mean? So get to your show. I mean, your shows. It's cool because. You guys are, it feels like you're back full swing. Is this year back kind of almost fully? Right now, this would be Marlboro. And that was the show that we postponed until April. The main reason was because when we were considering, or not we, I keep saying we, when my son was considering whether he should postpone it or not, they called out the National Guard in Boston because they had an upswing. The hospitals were filled. And he's thinking, you know, maybe... I'm going to call and see if I could change the date. So he switched the date till April. And before he did that, he called up every exhibitor. And we had a number of exhibitors that couldn't come because of the requirements to go in and out of Canada. We had a lot of Canadian lodges up in the Boston area. So he lost uh, maybe 10 or 15 exhibitors that couldn't come. And then a couple celebrities, we have a celebrity that comes all the time from Canada and he can't come now because of the restrictions and taking a test to fly back to Canada. So he got a date in April and we thought, you know what? No football in April. Brady's in Florida. No snowstorm. Hopefully there's no spring snowstorm. And every exhibitor said, hey, let's give April a try. There's only two exhibitors that said they couldn't come in April. So he's going to have the show in April. But every other show right now, we have uh, a few less booths in a couple shows. But then the show in, in Denver is, I think, sold out already. We have that uh, in, in three weekends from now. We have the first show in Edison in New Jersey next weekend. And then we go right to Atlanta for a show there. And then we go to Denver. And then after that, uh, we have a week off, and then we do San Francisco and then Lancaster. And then it's it's March already. The, the show season's short. It's only eight or nine weeks. So And, and we're, we don't have the Denver show the first weekend in uh, January well, like we used to. But that is because of the answer to the one question that you asked me that I really didn't get into it. But we lost the convention center use in Denver. You know about that at all? Mm, no, I didn't know what's going on there. Well, we had the show in Denver, and it was actually getting just as big as the one in Jersey and almost as many people. And then Ben took – that's the year Ben took over. Uh, he got a letter from the people that leased the the convention hall. It was the uh, the convention hall that we had used for, what, 15 years that I had used too. And it's closed because of the pandemic. So now they couldn't have any events there. And because they couldn't have any events, they couldn't rent it. They couldn't pay the mortgage. So the letter said that the bank took over 
the mortgage and they foreclosed on the people that leased it from the bank and they put it up for auction. So the entire exhibit hall complex, the merchandise mart, it was called the Denver Merchandise Mart, it was put up for bid and the rumor is that Amazon bought it and they're going to level it and put up a big warehouse. Oh, wow. So we had no place to do our second biggest show and we would get around 8,000 to 10,000 people there. They loved it in Denver. And fortunately, there was a place that was being constructed that nobody paid attention to because it was out on the plains about 15 minutes from the airport. It looked like some kind of a 55 and older uh, resident place that they're popping up, you know, where Mm -hmm. everybody goes there and lives the rest of their life happy. (laughs) But it ended up, they finished it, and then the pandemic hit. So they couldn't rent anything, and we found out about it. And what it is, it's, it's called the Gaylord Rocky Mountain Resort by Marriott. And Ben went over and talked to them, and he was lucky enough to book a weekend. And it's enormous. It's, it's only 15 minutes from the airport. It has 1,300 rooms, two 100,000-square-foot exhibit halls, uh, seven restaurants, a big water park. Unbelievable. It's like a miniature Disney, and it just opened up because they're able to book rooms wow. and events. So we're lucky. We're, we're anxious to see how many people come there. So that's that, that was the worst thing that happened, period. Losing Denver, where we had such a huge show, we figured in another year there, it was going to be just as big as our biggest show in New Jersey. And then all of a sudden, the show was gone. We had no place to go. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Teddy Fly is established in 1928 as the oldest family-run fly shop in the country. And you know, the history is a big part for me, so this is super awesome that we have them going right now. We've got a couple episodes coming up on some history, and I know daddy has been involved in a lot of that history, especially out in the northeast part of the country. And uh, long before I connected with daddy I had heard lots about them on the podcast from different listeners and different uh, guests on the show. So it's pretty exciting to have them on and having the connection as a sponsor to this podcast. Deddy is located in Livingston Manor on the banks of Willowemont Creek. Deddy is your welcoming place online or on the creek. The retail shop has a great selection of flies, materials, fly fishing gear, books, and more. Deddy Fly's inventory consists solely of products that meet every angler's demand for high quality and service. Of course, they also offer casting lessons as well as guided trips. For more information, head over to Deddy Flies, that's wetflyswing.com slash Deddy. You can also give them a call right now, 845-439-1166. Deddy Flies, D-E-T-T-E. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to check out Deddy. Okay, let's get back to the show. Wow, so you got that back. So yeah, Denver's going to be huge this year and, and New Jersey's going to be huge. What's your... What is your uh, overall, on average, what's your smallest show as far as, you know? the small? Well, the way it worked out, the only weekend that we could book that Marriott in Denver was the weekend that we had to show up in Seattle. It, it, was, it was in the town of Linwood, which was right yeah. near Seattle. That was our smallest show, and that happened to be the same weekend. So Ben had a choice. Do I want to book this place in Denver, the new place? It's going to be big and expensive and a different date. Or do I want to go to, to Linwood? So he he was able, well, you know what? I forgot about this too. Th- that weekend, they were actually going to change our date because it was uh, Valentine's Day weekend. It just happened to fall the weekend we were going to be in <laughs> Linwood. Well, they have a, a big party at the convention center for Valentine's Day. <laughs> And what did I say? Sweetheart Day or Valentine's Day? It's Valentine's, Valentine's Day, yeah. So they actually had it, bu- had it booked, and they were trying to switch us to another weekend. And, of course, we didn't have anything open, so we had to bump that show out. And it was luckily our smallest show. So we still go to the one in San Francisco and the one in Lancaster is the last weekend of the year. 
And that's good. That gives a little run. I'm curious on these celebrities. So when you say celebrities, you're talking about um, talking about some of those celebrities. Who have you had there over the years? And who you know what I mean? Like who are some of the big names? Well, I'll go back to the first show that I went to visit, the one in uh, Michigan, the Midwest Fly Fishing Expo, the first one I ever went to. I and I got my idea of trying that at Seven Springs. I met Gary Borger and Gary Lafontaine, and those guys were so nice. And I became friends with them because a couple of years later, I started contacting them and say, hey, I'm starting a show in Pennsylvania, blah, blah, blah. Gary Borger right now does all our shows. And of course, you know that, that Gary LaFontaine passed away. And uh, he was great. I, I got to be good friends with him. I actually fished uh, with him with his dog, Chester. And this is a funny, quick story. His dog was trained to watch his indicator and when I fished with him out west, I was from the east, and we didn't use indicators at that time. I still don't use them. But Gary had that on his line. I said, what's that? He said, that's my indicator. Watch this. And he cast it out, and he had a hit, and his dog was sitting in the water next to him, and his dog would bark. Chester would bark when he got a hit on the indicator. I couldn't believe it. The dog was so smart. Wow. But anyway, right now, Talking about the celebrities coming up in, in New Jersey, I just counted the photos that we had, and a couple of them we don't have photos of, but we have close to 30 celebrities. And that's why the show is so enormous, because in order to pay for a facility for the size of the show that I created, I have to have a lot of money. And in order to get money, I have to have a lot of people come and buy tickets and in order for them to be happy, I have to have a lot of celebrities. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a balancing act, like a juggler balancing five balls in the air. And you hope that you don't get a snowstorm or Brady doesn't play football. <laughs> and you got enough money to, to go on a fishing trip once the shows are closed. But we have big celebrities at every show. I started off, the first one I did at Seven Springs, of course, I had George Harvey and this other guy by the name of Lefty Cray. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Lefty Cray almost he almost needed an agent. He booked all his own stuff, but he he told me he said, "If you want me next year, you better book me now because I'm booking shows a year and a half ahead of time." <laughs> yeah. But Lefty worked for me. I hate to say worked for me. He worked for me, but I listened to him and I did what he wanted me to do because he was he was a smart one. He worked, oh, I don't know, maybe three, four shows a year. Uh, he probably worked 60 times together with me. Wow. And George worked until he was 90 years old. And he said, this is it. I said, what do you mean? He says, Chuck, I don't remember anybody's name. I've had all these students at Penn State, and they come up to me, and they talk to me, and it just makes me so frustrated. I can't remember their names. It's time for me to... Stop doing the show. So and that was it. And he died at 94. Oh, wow. So, and two days ago, I called Joe to wish him a happy birthday. Joe Humphreys just turned 93. Yep. And he, he's doing our Lancaster show. But now he dropped out of our other shows because he doesn't want the hassle of flying and traveling. So he's doing Lancaster, and he's going to drive there with his family. And, uh, you know, I, I've... I've been lucky to know so many celebrities, but the sad thing is every year we get older and somebody might get sick like Gary LaFontaine. He died at a real early age. I, I, I lost Dick Talor, Ernie Schwebert. I mean, I could go on and on. And uh, But the good thing is we have a lot of young people coming into the sport. We have a lot of, a lot of children, a lot of teenagers, and a lot of women, a lot of women coming. Yeah. I never had any chance to hire any ladies the first couple of years. The only one that I hired was because, you know, I knew Barry Beck and, and Kathy was so great. She was the only one that I knew at that time. Oh, yeah. What about Joan Wolf? She's been out there a little while. Oh, Joan. <laughs> I hate to say what her age is because she might get mad at me, but <laughs> I call her every year. I say, hey, Joan, did you change your mind about doing some casting at the show? And she laughs and no, I'm not coming. Oh, Roy. She did the show, I don't know what, what the last year was, probably about six years ago in Somerset. And she she was uh, out there at the pond in a one-piece jumpsuit 
And I don't want to tell you her age, but she looked like she was about 55. <laughs> but that wasn't wow. even close to her age. No. But she was fabulous. But she she has her her school and she does guest appearances, you know, at her private school up in New York. And uh, right now we're we're using Sheila Hassan or ha Hassan. I, I don't know how she likes to pronounce, mm -hmm. but she works at the school and directs it for Joan. And now she's taken Joan's place. And then we have Wendy Gunn. We had Sarah Gardner. We had a couple. There's a couple women at Ben knows because, of course, you know Ben's a lot younger than me, and and the women look at me as an old person. They look at Ben as a nice looking guy, <laughs> so he gets to know them better than me. But he has a couple girls that are guides out west that uh, have their own own guide service. That they're really knowledgeable yeah. and great casters. And let's face it, when you get when you get 200 people at a pond and 160 of them are guys between 30 and 60, and a girl gets up there and casts the length of the pond, it blows them away. They yeah. they love it. They love to see these girls teach them things because Lefty told me, he said, if you want me to teach someone to fly fish, I could teach a female twice as fast as I could teach a guy. They listen. They listen to you. They pay attention. The guys don't want to do what you want right away. They want to do what they want to do. The girls are the easiest. Yeah, I totally know. That's good. How do you, when you get up there, so you mentioned a couple of these things that happen, you know, older people have passed away. So you lose, say, a, you know, Ernie Schwebert or, uh, you know, Lefty Cray. I mean, how do you fill that spot when you think like, okay, I, I mean, because you can't really, right? You can't fill a Lefty Cray, but you do find somebody. How, what does that process look like? Well, every year we have the, the noted celebrities that everybody knows that's been in the sport a long time. But there are a lot of young people now that are getting known. They haven't, we don't want to say they haven't paid their dues because the celebrities that people know that are in their 60s and 70s, there wasn't even a cell phone when they started doing the shows. So these people that like, like you, they have blogs. They they have newsletters. They're they're on the computer. They're on Facebook. They're tweeting. I mean, they know each other. And I was, I hate to say this, I was scared <laughs> when I saw all this happening over the internet. And I'm going to say, hey, who wants to go to a show when they could sit home in their pajamas and have a beer and a sandwich and talk to someone on a <laughs> computer? They're not going to go to any shows. And I was so happy that I was wrong because what, wrong. what it's done is it made them want to meet these people in person. Exactly. So after, after they talk to you on the internet somehow and, and go back and forth with stories and they can't wait to come to the show to meet you in person. And that's what happened with me. The people that I met at the shows, now two guys that I fish with almost twice a year, they come from Europe and they came to my international fly tying symposium and I got to know them and we fished together and now we're best friends. So that's the greatest thing about doing the shows. I have a lot of friends that are in the fly fishing and fly tying industry that I might never have met. Yeah. And then the sad thing is the opposite. As we get older, you call and the wife answers the phone says, Oh, I hate to tell you, but Bobby had a heart attack last month and, passed away or something you know then, then you have to say well i'm glad i got to know him and we spent all that time together and we, we had a great friendship so that's right yeah i know it's tough it's the yeah i mean and even that you know at my you know age i'm not you know i, I can't remember uh ben well, how old is ben remind me again he just ben. turned 50 yeah and the other guy that that you met that knows me and we became friends the last three or four years and he told I think he told you about me, or, or you asked him yeah. if he knew. To, Kamisa. To Kamisa. Yeah. He just called me yesterday, and we talked. We talked oh, like yeah. every couple of days. But those are the kind of people that we love to find to come to the shows, and we hire them, and they're like second string. And when yeah. the first person falls and twists their ankle in a basketball game, you put the sixth guy in or the seventh guy or the eighth guy. So we're substituting some of these younger people that get the, and there, there are phonies, of course, that get on yep. the internet that act like they know everything about fly fishing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, once you meet them, you, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I could, I could, I could tell right away whether they're going to be on time for a lecture or they're in the bar 
uh, oh, yeah. acting silly and you know yeah almost everybody that we use i would recommend there's hardly anybody that i would suggest uh wouldn't be worth hiring so yeah but everybody everybody is is on board for the shows they really miss the shows and we're so glad that they're coming back and we're going to look for a big crowd uh, once we open the doors next weekend that's awesome that's why I was happy to do this episode. I think the timing's perfect because we'll get it out to hopefully some more people. And, yeah. and uh, I'm definitely going to make my way to as many as I can uh, this year. And uh, it's it's good. Yeah, I think uh, Tim Camise is awesome. And there are a bunch of young younger people out there that are going to keep you know getting bigger. And I just think, am I always bring up my girls? I've got a couple of young kids and, and I just hope that you know what I mean like when they get up to the you know my age there'll still be lots of these shows going on and uh yeah yeah it's fun well I I talked to another guy yesterday he asked about a shirt that he had ordered do you know Sunto oh yeah okay I thought you might he's fairly new you know he's one of these guys that just came came out like like the first time I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show I mean that's what said Sunto was like he came out as a fly tire, and he was unbelievable. And he had only been tying flies for like a year, and he blew everybody away. Well, he's going to come to our show in Atlanta because he's stationed down here now in North Carolina. Oh, wow. Good. Yeah. He just called, and he's going to go down there and uh, come over. Amazing. But uh, the only show that I do, and I didn't mention this, is I still do the International Fly Tying Symposium, and I had that the weekend before Thanksgiving this year, and I still had it. And Ben does all the fly fishing shows. So I I don't want to act like I'm completely in a rocking chair forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on that. And we really, that was always like the canary in the mines. When, when I had the tying symposium in November, when I had that crowd, I could tell whether they were going to be anxious for the shows in January and February. If I had a bad crowd, then I knew things were slow. The economy hurt people. They don't want to spend money, whatever. But it was always an indication, and it was always right. When we had a lot of people in November, the people were going to come in January and February. Then I had a good. I had a the same kind of people that came prior to the pandemic came to the tying symposium. We didn't increase, but we didn't decrease either. It was like about the same thing. The only thing we lost was one or two people that always come from Europe that couldn't fly because of the restrictions in, in the countries in Europe that closed the airports down. Gotcha. And that was the only, only thing that happened. So, so the flight tying uh, symposium, that, and that is a huge event. I mean, definitely one I hope to get to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe next year I'll be able to make it out there, but, um, what, let's talk about the shows really well before we get to the shows I want to talk a little bit of detail on the show but before we get there uh, you mentioned the Beatles which is one of my favorite uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, tell tell me that were you do you remember that uh, when they were on Ed Sullivan the first time well I guess I've been kind of lucky at predicting things the same thing with the shows you know when I opened the main shows it was when the river runs through it came out oh yeah you open it right when that happened. Yeah, so I I just been lucky, and when the Beatles came on television, I said those guys are going to be the biggest group in the history of rock and roll. I knew right away that that was going to happen, and I couldn't believe it. And the same thing happened when the first time that Elvis Presley came on Ed Sullivan's, and I always think about that because when people try to say, how do you describe yourself with these fly fishing shows? I said, well, I'm kind of like the Ed Sullivan of fly fishing. I introduce these people and they do all the performing and I don't, but I do fly fish and fly ties. I said, that's the only difference. Ed Sullivan doesn't tap dance. He's not a magician. He doesn't sing. All he does <laughs> is present it for everybody else. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You're the Ed Sullivan of the fly fishing. You're totally, I mean, that, that that's exactly it. And it's, it's cool to look at, you know, you mentioned the celebrities, I, you know, over the years, do you ever get any, because I'm doing a little kick, I've got a really um, famous celebrity, I'm not going to put uh, the name out there, it's actually, he's a, a, in the film industry, but um, he's also a fly fisherman, right, he loves it, so there's some people out there, do you ever get those, or talk to those people over the years, where it's like, you know, name, like, you know, like, I don't know, um, Robert Redford, right, he, yeah, he, oh, he, yeah. he wrote, he did the movie, you know, have yeah. you ever had any of those people come to the show, or, or interest? No, and, uh, Oh, 
what's Fonz's name? I forgot his name. He came out with the book. Henry Winkler. Yeah, I wanted to try to get him to come, but you know, it's it's funny you brought that up because it it just popped out of my head before when when I talked to Herman about the exhibit hall at Seven Springs to get to to start a fly mm-hmm. fishing show. He said you could do whatever you want to. It's going to be free that weekend. Well, guess what I thought I would do? I thought, well, why don't I have a a music concert? Let's get John Denver. This was when John Denver mm-hmm. was huge. I called the agent, believe it or not. And she said, well, what kind of a venue is it that you want to hire Mr. Denver for? I said, well, it's a ski resort and it's a convention hall and it seats maybe 12 or 1,500 people. And there was silence. And she says, well, Mr. Denver is usually used to playing for an average of maybe 50,000 people in arenas and football stadiums. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, okay. I think I'm not going to be able to afford no. to hire John Denver. <laughs> no, that's the problem. Yeah, I think you got to you got to get to the uh, you got to find the John Denver's, you know, the musicians that are also fly fishing uh, fanatics, and then hit them on that and be like, hey. And I'm trying to think of who the other ones are. They they have come to the shows. We used to have some, and I'm not into the politics that much, but we had, I think, a superior court judge that came to our show when we did the show at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And I knew he was at the show, and then uh, the guy would come to the exit door in a black suit, two of them, and uh, they'd check out the door, and then they'd bring him in. They already checked with me and said, I have blah, blah, yeah. and I can't yeah. remember his name. So we would get these people that would come in the exit doors, and uh, I didn't know them, but I know we had celebrities. And, and, of course, my son, before he took over the shows, and he still does it, he has the book business. Now, you know that I didn't run the shows by myself forever. I had a partner the first 10 years, and that was Barry Serviente. Well, Barry Serviente had a book business called The Angler's Art. Mm-hmm. And when I started the first show at Seven Springs, it was the first one that any individual had actually done. It wasn't a club. And then I, I started it in April, and then I heard that somebody in July – in Carlisle was going to have a book fair, a fly fishing and book fair. I said, who the heck is that? After I had this idea that I stole from the Michigan guys, now someone two hours away is going to have an event too. So I got to meet him. Anyway, to make a long story short, we got to be friends. He came to my show and exhibited, and then we decided to to get to be partners and try a show in a bigger place other than Seven Springs. He kept his show in Carlisle. I kept mine at Seven Springs. But we went in partners, and we that's when we did the show in Somerset, New Jersey. We started off, we invested all of our money. We each had $2,500. And we said, if we get, no, I, I'm sorry, if we get 2,500 people, we'll be able to pay for the facility. Well, we had no clue what was going to happen, and we ended up with 6,400 people that weekend. And the the word spread like crazy. The show opened up, and the the fly fishing crowd was unbelievable. Barry and Kathy Beck actually had a store at that time, and Barry had a cardboard box on the floor. I said, what's that for? And he showed me. He said, that's where I throw the $100 bills. He sold so much when we opened the door. The crowd was vicious. They wanted to come in and buy everything. And the show just got such a reputation like overnight, it was like instant success. And Barry and I were so happy because we weren't penniless. We had enough money to pay for all the bills. <laughs> wow. That was a big surprise. And the reason I'm saying that is because after that happened, that was the next to the last event in the country and the next event was the final fly fishing event that everybody went to to end the show season. And guess what that was? Hmm. San Mateo, where Ed Rice had fly fishing at his show for already 10 years. Oh, wow. So he called me on the phone. Hey, I'm Ed Rice. What's this about a fly fishing show that everybody's been talking about at my show? He was so mad. People were setting up, and all they were doing was talking about, hey, did you hear about that show in Somerset, New Jersey? And Ed Rice, as I said, you know, he, he was getting rubbed the wrong way because he was the king of the fly fishing show industry because he had it in his sportsman show. 
Yeah. So, so he invited me out. He said, you come out here. I'll get you a motel room and we'll hang out and I'll show you what a real fly fishing show is like. <laughs> so we, we became to know each other, but I didn't bother his shows in California. But what happened is over the next five to eight years, our shows got so big in the eastern part of the country, then we finally moved to Denver. And that was the first time we went out west or anywhere close to the western area. And then, of course, Barry and I had a deal where one year, if you felt that you wanted to pick a location, that was your turn. And then Barry picked San Francisco. Well, that didn't go over big with Ed because that would compete with his show out in the West Coast. So those things happen. We try to avoid not doing a weekend where anybody else does something. And after I left Seven Springs, the big Trout and Lima Club in Pittsburgh, uh, Penns Woods West, they had like 600 members. It was the biggest Trout and Limited Club in Pennsylvania and maybe the nation. Well, they said, you know, Chuck left Seven Springs. Why don't we do a show and do it called Cabin Fever? Well, that's what they did. And then I, I never went back to the Pittsburgh area for a show because I didn't want to compete with the local chapter that I was a member of, actually. <laughs> so, you know, talking about the competition, like you mentioned, there are a lot of people yeah. that, that try to do shows, but anybody that does a club show and it's nonprofit and they take the money that they earn and pay for the facility and pay for celebrities and what's left over, they use it yeah. for stream improvement, teach classes, so. hire celebrities to come to maybe a weekly meeting to be a guest speaker. They promote fly fishing so much that guess what happens? The sport grows. And when you get more people in the sport, guess what they do? They buy more tickets at the fly fishing show. So they're helping me. I don't want to hurt them. Exactly. No, I think that's where Ed, it sounds like Ed Rice maybe had it. And I'm not sure what happened with his situation. And eventually, I guess it went away. But you know, I, I look at this podcast. There's a bunch of new fly fishing podcasts out. We've been doing it a while now, so we're oh, I'm sure. Good, but but I'm not I'm not ever worried. I always see that as a positive. I'm like, man, that's great. You know, it's not competition. These are you know more people to listen to a new diverse voice, right? And that's going to just like you said, it's going to keep them in. It's going to show get more people into it. So it seems like that's the mindset you've had the whole time. You haven't really been worried because you know the work it takes to have a, a successful show. Yeah. Well, you know the saying, competition just makes you work harder. Mm -hmm. but there is a downside to that that people don't know about. Let's say you come to my, my show and you see that you could do that back home, but you're not back home in Denver or San Francisco or whatever. You're back home in Philadelphia and my show is an hour away in New Jersey and you try a show and you don't know what you're doing and you tell everybody how great it's going to be and you get people that are so mad because they lost money you know what they say? That's it. I'm not doing any more shows. So then we oh. can lose exhibits because someone did a lousy job. All right. That's not good. You have to depend on the success to make you work harder. And then that's what we tried to do. With over 40 years of experience in coffee, that's four zero, four zero years. The English coffee team is kicking out some good coffee. Joe has been doing this for a long time. He tells a story on a full-length episode we had a while back. And, uh, and I can just tell you this coffee is awesome. We've got actually uh, a giveaway going on right now. You could check that one out at uh, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. And, uh, and check out what Joe has going. But if you could support him, that would be amazing. Their coffee is roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness. And for me, it's all about that fresh taste of coffee in the morning. Uh, cracking open a bag, whether on the water or at home, is always an amazing feeling in the morning. So, so that's what keeps me going. You know, I've always got a cup of coffee going. The Artist Series uh, sends $1 for each sale to Casting for Recovery, another great, uh, great organization. And they have a blend of every taste, a dry dropper bag option, a roast sampler, and tons of different extras. Joe is kind of, he's, he's kind of tucking into everything, every little aspect he can to, uh, to kick this thing off. And they just finished their first year of business. So it's exciting to be around with, uh, with anglers and be celebrating another year of great coffee. You can head over to webflyswing.com anglers to grab your bag of greatness today.
That's wetflyswing.com slash anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S. You support this podcast by clicking over through that link. Okay, now back to the show. I feel like we have a pretty good feel of, you know, a little bit of the history. You know, the show itself, I know you're kind of out of that show scene a little bit, but, um, you know, talk about the show when you walk in, and I know Ben painted this picture a little bit when he was on a couple years ago. Um, but what is it like? So you walk in there, give us that first for you, you know, if somebody's new listening right now, they haven't been to one of your shows and they're going to walk into it. What can they expect? Well, you put your five-year-old shoes on and walk in Toys R Us. And what do you see? (laughs) You see everything you want. That's what the fly fishing show is like. The thing that is hard for me, if I was a customer, is to pick what seminars I want to go to. I counted the seminars up in our show in New Jersey, and we have at least 15 to 20 things going on every hour. We have eight destination theaters, and each one of them has a tremendous program by the guy that either owns the lodge or is the guide at the lodge. So you get the information from the person that fishes there for his whole life. You might go want to say, okay, I want to find out about New Zealand. We got a show about New Zealand. Oh no. Well, that one in New Zealand is that they're doing the one on Alaska. And then there's doing the one on Kamchatka at the same time. And then there's that one in Africa for tiger fish. And which one do I want to go to? So that's the hardest thing. You have to decide. And there are guys that come in with a sheet of paper every hour where they want to be. It's like Mm -hmm. they know what they want to see. So there's so much to see. You never, you can't be bored. You can be there for three days and not see everything because you have rods to test. There are guys that spend most of their time watching all the fly tires in the owl fly time. We have maybe 60 fly tires. And it, they spend hours watching these. That's the reason I, we didn't talk about that, but the reason I started the International Fly Tying Symposium, because at Seven Springs when I had the fly fishing show, it wasn't that. It was called the Fly Fisher Symposium. That's mm-hmm. what I called it, the first one. Mm-hmm. When I closed the show, the only people that were left that I couldn't kick out were the ones that were standing in front of the fly tires. Mm. So the fly tires got together and said, hey, why don't we do a fly tying event in November before winter and just call it the fly tying symposium. So that's when I started the fly tire symposium. It was all fly tying. And you can spend the whole two days or three days at a symposium just being in front of the fly tire. So you'll find things that uh, the shops have that they're overloaded. They order too many items of the one thing and they'll put it on sale. So you get deals uh, God, hmm. you know, the one booth that people rush to immediately and he's right at the front door is Bill Keogh. He owns Hairline Dubbing now. You know, he bought that company because you're you're not probably far from him. He's in Portland, right? Mm-hmm. He yeah. owns uh, Hairline Dubbing, but he's also one of the major suppliers of Hackle in the world. You know, it's him and Bucky Metz and... Uh, his competition more or less is in Wapsie there in Arkansas. But Bill comes to the show and sets up 30 feet of nothing but hackle. I mean, you could go there and dig through two or 3,000 necks that are on sale because something broke or he has too many or he dyed too many colors that they didn't want all the blacks and he has two dozen left over, so he puts them out for sale. I mean, there's nothing better than going through that in your hands and picking out the feathers that you want. You can't do it on the Internet all the time. It's the same with a rod. You can't cast it by looking at it on a computer. You have to hold it in your hands. So that's the best thing about the shows. You walk in, you have so many decisions and so many things to decide. It's all there for you. No, I agree. I think it's yeah, it's the personal connection. Even this day and age, like you said, with all these cell phones and all the, everybody's online. I mean, there will never be a replacement with sitting there face to face with somebody, right? Shaking their hand, talking about the trip, their lodge, their their product. I mean, everything. That that's why it's so powerful. That's why people when they go to your show, I mean, these companies, right? The brands there, they they sell. I just heard from somebody who was talking about Denver, and he said, "Man, they're gonna have their best their best weekend when they go to that your show in Denver." Oh, absolutely. The only sad thing that was 
hard to be upset about because you have to understand business. There are some major companies that have been hurt by this uh, pandemic that lost a lot of employees. And they don't have, an, let's say they're a company that has rods that people are interested in, but not a major company. But so people like Sage and Orvis, they have so many people that are out sick that can't come. They don't have the staff to do the shows. And some of them have been purchased by people that aren't really lifetime fly fishermen. They're people that have made a lot of money, maybe in Silicon Valley, that have millions of dollars to invest. So they'll buy a major company. Let's just say Sims. Sims maybe would be purchased by somebody. Well, that happened with uh, Abel Real. Steve Abel was a friend of mine, and you know he got sick and had to sell his business, and he beat his health problems, and he had to sell Abel. But the people that that bought it also bought a couple other companies. So maybe a hundred percent of their business investments wasn't with Abel, so they cut back. I know they cut back on vices. They didn't make those. They didn't make uh, soft uh, carry packs and stuff. So. Things change like that with the major companies, but we always have someone that will come in with something new that makes you excited to go to a show. Gotcha. I just wish the big companies uh, would invest in hiring more people. They should have a, a show staff that would go to every show because they would make a lot more money when people see their products right in front of them. That's right. Yeah. And, and big companies is relative, right? Because I mean, some of the biggest companies in fly fishing, I'm not sure who they are, but um yeah, they don't they don't have a massive staff. I mean, a few of them do, but for the most part, you know, these are smaller. Uh, it's a small industry. Do you feel that you know that the fly fishing niche? You always hear about that when we talk about the business side that it's such this tiny niche. There's not a lot of money there. What, what's your take on that? Well, <laughs> you know, it was funny. I I took my fishing boat out uh, last week, and I stopped in to see the guys in the building, and there was a big bass boat in there. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> A giant engine, great big uh, depth. He had like two 18-inch depth finders by the steering wheel. And I saw on the side about 10 companies that sponsored it. And it was yeah. Mike Mike Iconelli. Does that ring a bell to you at all? No. He's a big-time bass competitor, and he's from Jersey. And I'm thinking, you know what? These guys go fishing for a weekend, and they have a chance to make a million dollars at a tournament. <laughs> Fly fishing is such a small thing, but we're so dedicated, and that's what we love. If Mike called me on the phone and said, you want to go bass fishing? I don't know, Mike. I think I'm going to go fish for stripers with my fly rod. I don't want to go catch a bass and pull it out of the water in three seconds, hoping that I'll make a bunch of money. <laughs> right. So it's just what you want to do. I mean, I I know the bass fishing thing is like enormous. I mean, if you want to be making a lot of money, you have to invest in it and buy a boat and travel and get in tournaments mm -hmm. and just be lucky. So, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I think it's, the, I was thinking about this when we were, you know, got started the passion, right? I mean, that, I think anybody who's doing this, you know, I think all of us have the same thing. You, you can't stick. I would imagine, you know, what you did since 1990, this show has not been easy, right? This has been, what's it taken for you to, to stick with it and grow it into this, the biggest fly fishing show? Is it the biggest fly fishing show in the, uh, in the world or what sort of, uh, or is it the country? I don't even know. Actually, it is, as far as I know. There's only one other show that's very unusual, and it's bigger in numbers because it's a specialized uh, uh, atmosphere. You know, we're all fly fishing. There aren't that many all fly fishing shows. But guess what they have in Italy? They have an all carp show, and I think it's called Carp Italia. I read about it in the World Tackle Trade magazine. They get 18,000 people. Wow. And it's they're all interested in carp fishing. That's it. Amazing. And that's the theme. So, yeah, this is this is a fly fishing theme, but there are other shows that uh, have other – you know, there's, there's an all-Canada show, I think, too. It's in Chicago, and every resort in Canada goes to that show. So there are other shows that have a niche – with a title that's pure, like ours is fly fishing, there are other shows that are pure. Yeah, but uh, we're the only all fly fishing show that I know of of its size. You know, so gotcha. we hope that it continues, and we 
we find that uh, we actually have more of a percentage increase every year than we do have a decrease. But this winter will be really a test to see how many people show up. We don't force anybody to come. You know, if they feel afraid that they might pick up the virus, they can stay home. Yeah. But we have so many people that that want to come. And as I mentioned, the small show, the International Flight Time Symposium, I couldn't walk down the aisle with someone stopping me and saying, Chuck, I want to thank you very much for putting this show on. I'm so tired of staying home watching Netflix and tying flies. I want to come to the show. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. It's like, uh, you know, this podcast we're doing right now, actually, we haven't been hurt too much by the COVID stuff because obviously right. it's all audio. And uh, oh, like you, should right be, you should be growing in leaps and bounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're growing. We're doing, we're doing well. We've had a good year. This is, in fact, we just had our best month since good. we've been doing this. Yeah, so it's, it's going good. But um, I hope I don't ruin it for you. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this is awesome. I mean, I think it's always, uh, it's always about the stories. You know, that's, that's, I don't know. Your show probably is partly that too. You know, like hearing the stories hearing about the people i, I love talking that's why getting you on was so cool you know you just broke down the history of the, of the biggest fly fishing show in the world we just learned about it and, and now we can go there and experience it right which is pretty amazing uh, let's do we got a little segment called fly shop friday this will kind of take us out of here um and i'm curious kind of think of your local fly shop and i'm not sure exactly where you are and i've got a little question for you too that you know to think about this but um, talk about that. Do you have a local fly shop uh, nearby, or who would you say is kind of your local shop, if you had to say one? Well, there's a lot of good people that are selling on the Internet, and that knocked out some of the fly shops that started when the river runs through it because everybody thought, oh, I could open up a fly shop. Well, you know why? They wanted to get products wholesale for themselves, and then oh. they found out it's not easy to run a fly shop no. and not lose money. So the closest one for me would be the biggest probably in New Jersey. They have uh, the one that's about two hours away, and it's tight lines. And then Ramsey isn't a fly shop, but they have the biggest selection of fly tackle and fly fishing equipment. And then, of course, you have Cabela's and Bass Pro. Now, yeah. I could go to Atlantic City in 20 minutes from where I live here in Ocean City and go to Bass, Bass Pro, and they would have – a pegboard wall 20 feet wide with all the fly tying materials that would be necessary to satisfy most people, not me, but most people. They have leaders, they have fly boxes, but then you walk over to the bass area and they have three aisles of 50 foot displays of spinning and casting rods. <laughs> yeah, they got everything. And they have a whole wall of tackle boxes and rubber plugs and baits and spinner baits and everything but there is fly fishing available but they're not you know they're not a hundred percent fly shop so there's wow. one the best shop uh, in pennsylvania they have four locations now is tco topa hawk and creek outfitters and they're exhibitors at our show hmm. now when you go when you go to the show if you go to the show in edison tight lines will have 10 booths so they're bringing in enough merchandise that a lot of the shops that, that are in small towns don't have as much as they bring to the weekend. And Topahawk and Creek Outfitters, I think they have eight or ten booths too. So almost everything that you'll see in an average shop in a small city will be right there for you to compare to. You can go to three different shops in one building and see as much as you can if you travel from three different cities in your area. But yeah, uh, we, right. we, we love to have the small guys stay in business. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes they come to the shows in the wintertime and 90% of their revenue that they make in January and February are from them doing shows. Because how many people – go into a store in a real rush in the middle of January and say, oh, there's a hatch on and I don't have the caddis. Well, there are no hatches except the midge, yeah. maybe. So they just go to hang out and talk. And when you want to talk to your friends, you'll meet them at a, at a show and go have breakfast together, go to the show, go out to dinner. 
And that's one of the main attractions is like you said, to see your buddies at the show mm -hmm. talk about yeah. fishing. Yeah, that is, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We're always trying to promote. That's why we kind of partly <clears throat> why we do that segment. I just love to promote some of the local shops and we'll put a, a links to the show in the show notes to those fly shops so we can get the word out. You had another, um, what is the, the buckskin wiggler. Is that a pattern that you, uh, you tied or created? Oh yeah. Well, at seven Springs, I owned a leather store, as I mentioned, and I, was in the business for 42 years and I know all the different kinds of leather that comes from all over the world. And I am imported uh, lambskin from New Zealand, sheepskin and lambskin. And it's very soft, but it's very tough. And I met the guys at a trade show in New York from New Zealand and they were fly fishermen. So they sold me the leather at a good price. And I started to make flies out of leather. I have all kinds of patterns now and, and actually Rainey's flies uh, has about a dozen of my patterns and I use leather in mo almost all my flies and uh, I cut the lambskin and I make uh, bodies for nymphs and I, I use it for tails and uh, I do a lot of imitations that nobody does with anything else. I make a, a complete baby flounder out of leather. The belly's white leather, the top is brown leather. I, I make... Uh, a uh, crayfish that looks like a real crayfish with little leather claws. And uh, oh, wow. I just don't have time to promote it. As I said earlier in the interview, I I help everybody else be recognized. And I'm, I'm not too busy yeah. to promote myself, really. That's right. And you, and you have these on. Yeah, so you, we can go to Rainey's. I'll put some links in the show notes. There's probably some videos out there to those flies as well. The buckskin wiggler, right? Yeah, right. You can buy them from Rain Rainey's, and it's so ridiculous. Matter of fact, the first time I tied it, I used it on the bighorn, and that's when the San Juan worm first started coming out. I'm talking 20-some years ago. And I'm fishing with this little red lambskin worm that I made, catching fish like crazy. And here's a guy up above that I could tell was a guide with a client, and he wasn't catching anything, and he finally walked down okay, what are you using? I said, hey, Gary. It was Gary Borger. <laughs> and I always tease him because he wanted to see what I was using. But it wasn't just the fly and it wasn't me. It just happened to be he was in a different part of the river and I was in a part that had a bunch of fish. So I, I said, hey, I'm not a better fisherman than you. <laughs> but I did give him a couple of the flies and, and he, he used them all the time. And uh, they really work. They really work. They wiggle as soon as they get wet. It looks like a real worm. Now, oh, gotcha. what do you think, of course, has, has become a, a famous fly in the last few years that would imitate what I was doing? Uh, the, you mean the... Uh, the Squirmy wormy. Oh, the squirmy. Yeah, that's right. I told Tim Camisa, don't fish with me if you're going to use a squirmy wormy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Camisa... Kamisa did say, I got to give a shout out to Kamisa. He said uh, he wanted me to ask you um, why you catch so many suckers when you're fishing with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, boy, I got the biggest broad trout I think we caught. I saw that. He sent me a photo. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. a, that was a big, that was like an 18-inch sucker, right? It was brown and yellow in the water. And I said, that's a broad trout. And then finally I caught it in. I saw the lips. I said, oh, yeah. man. And he said, that's I got to awesome. get a picture of that. So, Yeah. Well, I mean, in the West, I mean, obviously we have different sucker species, but yeah, I mean, those are, those are native fish. You know what I mean? They're suckers, but they're, they're native fish. So it's, it's all good. Hey, carp are coming on stronger than ever. I'd like to catch a carp anytime on a fly. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many things. So, so this is cool. Well, we're going to definitely send some people out to the show this year. We're going to get some new people, hopefully uh, your way. Um, before we head out of here, anything uh, you want to just, you know, with you in the next kind of year or anything we missed today, you want to just give a shout out to before we head out? Oh, I think I talked a lot, probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody uh, that wants to ask me anything, uh, you know, they can reach me, as I said, Chuck at flyfishingshow.com. My son gets about 100 emails a day. I get maybe five. So I got time to answer yeah. anybody. Yeah, you got it. But uh, yeah. If you see him, give him a handshake and say you're doing a great job. Not as good as your father used to do, but <laughs> no, don't say that. No, that's, I'm only joking. He's, <laughs> he's twice as good as I ever was. 
Yeah. Well, now we got both. You know, we've got you on, and we had Ben on, so we yeah. got the two episodes, and I'll put a link out to that one Great. as well, so people can take a look. And uh, yeah, the flyfishingshow dot com is where people can go, and I love that it's. I've kind of copied you guys a little bit because whenever I go on the podcast, I kind of welcome people to the fly fishing show. This is our podcasting show, and yeah, and it's uh, you know what I mean. It's kind of the same sort of thing. We all have a, a show, or we have a, a fly shop, or whatever the thing is. But the point is to um, create a cool experience and. I think we've done that today, uh, Chuck. And uh, thanks again for all your time. I appreciate you coming on. Well, I appreciate you contacting me. Nice talking with you. Thank you very much. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 292. 292 will get you the links, everything we talked about today. You can easily click over there. One other quick heads up. If you head over to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway, that's a giveaway, G-I-V-E-A-W-A-Y. That's a hard one to say. Uh, you can check out our giveaway. We're going to be having some every week, uh, if we can, giveaways. And you can right now head over there and enter and hopefully win something cool. Stay tuned Tuesday for another huge follow-up episode. It's just uh, Tuesday is just one of the longest-running uh, powerhouse websites in the fly fishing space. Uh, Mid Current with Marshall Cutchen. Tuesday, we dig into another good one. So uh, we're following up these episodes with some good stuff. And I, to be honest with you right now, I'm trying to think what we covered. I, I know we, we dug into a few different topics. So check it out. You can click that subscribe button or go to wetflyswing.com slash subscribe. And you'll get notified when that episode goes live on whatever app you're enjoying. Okay, time to get off to the show if it's showtime, if it was showtime, if it's coming up showtime, check in with me. I'd love to see uh, if you're at the show. Uh, you can send me a message, Dave, at Wet Fly Swing or on social. Just uh, ping me and let me know you're there, and, uh, and I'd love to say hi. All right. Have a good day. See you at a show or see you on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.